So how's everyone feeling this morning? That's good. I'm a little sore, a little warm. A full day of uh, volleyball, beach volleyball at the Speedy Fest takes a much bigger toll on me than uh, I would have expected it to in previous years. So I'm feeling a little stiff and a little tight, but that's okay. Summer's great. It's good to enjoy summer and the nice weather, going outside, doing those types of things. So um, one of the other things that's great about summer, I mean, a lot of people already have uh, had opportunities to, to take their summer vacations, go on trips, and those types of things. And uh, the, uh, the opportunity to do our kind of annual 4th of July tradition now, where we go down to a fireworks store in Pennsylvania. emails. Uh, and so it's very important that I always have kind of a, a comfortable pair of shoes because I'm, I'm on my feet for, for much of the day. Uh, I got one of those Fitbits. I usually actually get about five times the amount of steps when I'm down there than I do when I'm up here. And so uh, this year, Stephanie and I were, were trying to get ready kind of ahead of time and, and trying to be ready. So uh, we actually packed uh, most of our stuff a few days before we were leaving. And so when it came time to, to go, we felt more prepared and, and we were all ready to go. And so the day we get down there, we kind of get settled in where we're staying and, and spend the first day kind of doing our, our, our respective jobs at the fireworks store. And then the day ends, go home, rest for the night, get up the next day. And uh, I'm getting ready to go and work this day. And so I'm sitting down and I'm on the, the foot of the bed and I got my duffel bag next to me and I'm got my shoes in front of me, my comfortable pair of shoes, and, and I'm digging around, and I'm shuffling through the duffel bag, and I'm throwing all, everything everywhere, and I realize I did not bring a single pair of socks with me for my comfortable shoes. And so I had sandals, but I was like, I am not going to wear sandals uh, the whole entire time that I'm working. And so socks were, were kind of one of those things that I realized, man, that was a necessity that, that I needed to bring with me, and not having it was, was an obstacle. Fortunately, I, I won't leave you guys hanging on the edge of your seats. There was a Walmart only 15 minutes down the road, and I was able to go and buy a pack of socks. So I'm wearing one of them today, and they're very comfortable. I'm very pleased. Um, but I bring this up uh, because this morning we're actually looking at uh, the first part of a, kind of a two-part journey uh, for, for Paul and Barnabas. They take this journey in Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14. And, and to be honest, uh, for, for these guys, they, they, they have bigger concerns than socks for, for their journey. Um, but, but they bring something or, or they have something brought with them is more accurate uh, that is uh, much more important, much more essential than socks, and that is the Holy Spirit goes with them on this journey. And uh, if you remember two weeks ago now, uh, we got to look at the, the significant church in the, the city of Antioch, and it was from this church where these guys, Saul and Barnabas, were commissioned, but it said they were actually called to this work by the Holy Spirit, set apart for this. And so this morning, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 4 of chapter 13, right after that, and we're going to go all the way through 41, where we simply see these guys go and make disciples. And then, Lord willing, uh, next week, we'll get to kind of look at part two of this journey, picking up in verse 42, all the way through the end of chapter 14. And so our outline for this morning's passage is, first, we see with these two in verses 4 through 12, really the persistence of Christ's body. And then in verses 13 through 25, uh, Paul begins teaching this sermon about the, the preparation for Christ's coming. And then he transitions in the second half of the sermon, verses 26 through 41, with a proclamation of Christ's resurrection. And what we learn from really this, this passage, the, the journey these men go on and the, the lesson that they teach is that salvation through Jesus Christ is what makes disciples. That's the gospel message. And so, therefore, if we are going to be faithful, if we are going to go and make disciples, our message must also then be salvation through Jesus Christ. 
And see, at this time in, in history, it was not the norm that churches would be sending out missionaries from among them. In fact, the church in Antioch is really the only one that's doing it at this time. See, before this, outside of a, a couple of instances where you have God just intervene in miraculous ways, like with Philip and, and with Peter, the gospel had spread beyond Jerusalem, primarily because Christians were just fleeing persecution. And so it's really beginning in Antioch, where churches execute this, this plan to, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth through the strategy that we call missions. And so this missionary journey in Acts, it's, it, it becomes foundational, not just this one, but really all of them, in how we as churches today do missions, both in international contexts like in Italy, but also locally here in Afton. And so again, the first example we see starts in verses 4 through 12, where we really see the persistence of Christ's body. And again, the, uh, the importance of, of having uh, the Holy Spirit with them is, is the very first thing that, that starts this section. Before we know where they travel, what they were doing, it says they're what? Sent out by the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, they were commissioned by the church, but ultimately, they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And so again, this reminds us, this is foundational, this is starting point one for us as Christians. If we go and we make disciples, we make disciples through the Holy Spirit sending us out into the world. And so after this reminder, uh, we, we get the beginning of the journey. Saul and Barnabas, they, they first go down to Seleucia. This is a port city in Antioch. And I did my best to kind of stretch this map as big as I could. So if you look in the, the right side, I put a blue box around the, the portion where we're talking about. So it's kind of in the, the bottom right portion of the map here. You got Syria is in green and kind of the northwestern portion of that. You see there's a little tiny dot in there, real tiny writing, um, and this is talking about the, the port city Seleucia. And so it's from, from that place, you can follow the red arrow. They go out to this island um, uh, called Cyprus, and they start on the eastern point of the, the island, um, in the city of Salamis. Now, Cyprus is a predominantly Greek island, um, but there were a, a number of Jews there, enough to have multiple synagogues here as well. And also, Cyprus is where Barnabas is from. So now you see the blue boxes are, is around Cyprus there. And so they start on the, the eastern coast of Cyprus. And it's here in uh, the, the, the next verse, um, verse five here, where we really see kind of the first example of the, the mission's strategy that Saul uses when he goes to places. It says that he goes to the synagogues first. He preaches to the Jews in the synagogues first. And just from a, a, a practicality standpoint, this makes sense. God had, had really prepared the Jews by their ultimate belief in him, in his word, in, in the, the scriptures, the prophets. And so Saul also became very convicted of this strategy. If you were to, to turn to Romans 1.16, Paul writes there that the gospel is the power of salvation, he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we see Saul and Barnabas, they implement this strategy here among other uh, journeys, but here they also have, it says John, this is John Mark, to assist them on this journey. But their travels continue, they don't seem to, uh, stay in Salamis for too long. Verse 6 says they, they basically make their way all the way across this 90-mile island from the east coast to the west coast, and now they end up in the, the, the capital city of Paphos. And as the capital city, this is where the Roman proconsul is stationed. And Saul and Barnabas do go on to eventually meet this man, but first they meet someone else, a magician. He is described actually as a Jewish false prophet named Bargesus which literally translates to son of Yeshua or son of the Savior. And Bar-Jesus seems to maybe work or counsels or something, has some sort of kind of working type relationship with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And so in these verses, we see these two men that we're introduced to are starkly contrasted against one another. First, again, we see Sergius here. He's open to God's word, right? What does it say? He says, he, he summons Barnabas. He, he calls Saul. He, he wants to hear about the word of God from them. Perhaps he was hungry for, for more counsel. He, he wanted some, something that seemed more true, more tangible than, than what he'd been hearing from Bar-Jesus. 
Saul and Barnabas, they, they offer something radically different from what this man would have been able to offer. So as an intelligent man, it seems, Sergius Paulus is attracted to the teaching of Saul and Barnabas. And it's an encouraging reminder that, that often it's the people we, we least expect could potentially be the most open to the gospel. We cannot assume to know who God may be preparing to hear the gospel. But then after we get to hear kind of where this guy's at, immediately after we see a contrast where Bar-Jesus opposes the gospel. Verse 8 says he is also known as uh, Elimus. Elimus. I had to listen to the audio transcript. Elimus, the magician. Um, And so as a magician, don't get confused. This guy, he's not... He's not pulling rabbits out of the hat. He's not doing card tricks or anything like that. He was a Jewish false prophet who was also called a magician. So this guy's more like a cult leader. And so here, as a cult leader, he is making his best effort to keep Sergius, the proconsul, from believing the gospel. He is acting, he's emulating the, the works of a demon by trying to get people to wander from the faith. Why? why? Why would this guy do this? And, 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 and we can only assume, but the assumption is that he saw the gospel in some way a, a threat to kind of this privileged position he had. I think there, there's enough uh, evidence here for us to, to take a step back and, and understand what, what Scripture teaches kind of on a larger scale, the, the, these obstacles that we see for people coming to trust the gospel. And two of the most common obstacles or two most common reasons that people oppose are pride and materialism. See, too often on on one end, we are either too proud to admit that we could possibly be wrong about about what we believe about this world, about life, and so we won't humble ourselves before the Lord. We won't confess that we are a sinner, and we won't trust in someone other than ourselves. Or we just simply don't want to give up a, a materialistic lifestyle. We don't want to sacrifice all the things that this world has to offer to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've counted the costs, and in our minds we say, "Eh, it's not worth it. And so the gospel confronts every idol, but these two idols especially we see. And when a person is not open to the gospel like Elamis the magician, greater opposition is to be expected. But then in verse 9, we see this opposition is just very briefly interrupted with an incredible turning point that's so subtle, if you blink, you'd miss it. It simply says, Saul, who was also called Paul. From this point forward, this is how he is referred to in Scripture. But up to this point, he has only been referred to as Saul, because Saul was his Jewish name. And so I'll confess a little bit, this could be a little bit of just a pet peeve of mine, but this kind of story of, of, of these tales of where Saul became Paul is, is really not true. It sounds nice because it makes for an easy kind of transformational story. But the reality is, is Saul always was Paul. He went by Saul in these Jewish contexts. And he went by Paul in Roman or Gentile contexts because Paul is his Roman name. And so the reality is he was actually probably Paul even before he ever became known as Saul because he was, excuse me, grew up in Tarsus, a Roman uh, situation, a Roman uh, city. And then it wasn't until later as a young man that he began Jewish training where he likely inherited the name Saul. But Saul, I mean, it was back in chapter 9 where he trusted in Christ. And from that point, he didn't just start going by Paul. He continued to go by Saul. It's not until now. Chapter 13, this is years later that he begins going by Paul. He was Saul when he actually taught at the church in Antioch. He was Saul. It was Saul that the Holy Spirit called to to be set apart to go on the mission field. And so it was Saul when he was sent out as a missionary. But now he begins to go by Paul because he is contextualizing to the Gentiles, the Greeks. And he's doing this for the sake of the gospel. He is willing to to even go by a completely different name out of the desire to to reach these people with the gospel. It's not as if he's rejecting his Jewish background by doing this. He's he's not even, as some has proposed, changing his name to avoid the persecution that was now going to happen to this Saul guy. He's adapting to his context. 
And so likewise, we must be willing to sacrifice anything that could be a stumbling block or a distraction from the gospel. And so now it says Paul, he's been filled with the Spirit, according to verse 9. And then he goes on to remove another obstacle in verse 10. But this obstacle is Elamis, the magician. He condemns this man for trying to corrupt Sergius, the proconsul, from, from following the straight paths of the Lord, he says. He calls, listen to the names that he calls Elamis, son of the devil. This is playing off this idea that Elamis is supposed to be the, the son of the Savior. He says he is full of all deceit and villainy. He is an enemy of all righteousness. He is using very harsh language here. And he does so for two reasons. First, because Sergius's soul is at stake. Paul is deeply compassionate for Sergius to trust in Christ. And Jesus similarly taught back in Matthew 18 that, that it would be better off for a person to just jump in the ocean with this giant stone tied around their neck than it would be to stand in the way of people from coming to him. And so this shows us eternal life is serious business, and so Paul is taking it seriously. But the second reason, as verse 9 kind of prefaced this, these words here, is that Paul is harsh because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit actually speaking through Paul here. And so Paul's harshness is not ultimately coming from him. It's coming from the Spirit. Notice Paul doesn't just go around being harsh to everyone, treating every unbeliever as if they were an obstacle. And so likewise, we cannot do that either. We can't speak harshly just because we see to everyone just because we see Paul do it in specific contexts. If we are to speak harshly to someone, it must come from the Spirit's leading. And as I was thinking about this, I was recollecting on my own kind of Christian life. And, and in my entire Christian life, I can only come up with one example where I'm confident that the Spirit actually filled me because the words came out and they were harsh and it was very almost unlike me and it came out and, and the person actually accepted the harsh words that I spoke to them. But unfortunately, the reality is I can also look back on my life and I can point out many other times where I have spoken harshly to someone. And unfortunately, in those times, the Spirit convicted me because I was wrong for speaking harshly in those moments. I was not being a, a faithful messenger for the Lord. And so don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of draw a, a, a difficult line to find here. I'm not saying that being bold is the same as being harsh. There is a difference. Sometimes being bold may include a harsh word. But just because we are being harsh, we cannot justify it by saying, well, I'm just being bold for the sake of the gospel. And so, yes, boldly proclaim the gospel. And when the Spirit leads, speak harshly if necessary. But do not just be harsh to people and pretend or justify it as if you are being bold for the gospel's sake. It takes great sensitivity to the Spirit's leading for us to be able to do this, and it is a challenge. But immediately after we see Paul is led by the Spirit here, God affirms that it was in fact the Spirit's leading for him to speak harshly in this way because he immediately strikes Elamis with blindness in verse 11. And it's beautiful because this even echoes Paul's own conversion from back in chapter 9. He was blinded, it said, after seeing the Lord. And like Elamis here, he had to be led by the hand. And so in these instances, the literal blindness is, is also illustrating kind of this spiritual blindness. And in Elamis's case, God shows grace and mercy toward him because he only blinds him for a limited time. He gives him a chance to repent and trust in Jesus. And so we see kind of in the midst of this uh, making of a disciple, this of, uh, of Sergius, we get opposition from Elamis, the magician. And so we need to look at this from a spiritual perspective. Because on one hand, we, we should be expecting this, opposition, spiritual warfare is going to be standing against us when we go to make disciples. But on the other hand, there's also kind of this, this certain joy that, that, that comes from facing opposition because it's in opposition that we actually have the opportunity to demonstrate the power of the gospel. And this is not something we can do in our own strength. 
That's why when Jesus commissioned us, he said, go and make disciples. He ended that by saying, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So if you are finding opposition when you are going to make disciples, don't assume that that means you are in the wrong or doing something wrong. Because sometimes it could actually be an indication that you are right where God wants you to be. It's the case with Paul and Barnabas here. They have found themselves by trying to make a disciple of Sergius that they're in a spiritual battle with a cult leader who is opposing them. But they continue to trust wholeheartedly in God, the God who has power to overcome cults, to, to overcome the spiritual forces of darkness, to overcome the enemy and everything he tries to use against us. So we too can be confident in the power of God's presence who is with us always to overcome opposition as we go and make disciples. And we are encouraged of this with how the story ends in verse 12. Elamis was darkened in judgment, but then contrasted to that, the light of salvation burst onto Sergius, the proconsul. This is a Roman leader. He had no Jewish background, but here he becomes a family member of God's family. Why? Because he believed. But notice why it says he believed. It says he's astonished, right? But it specifies. It's not that he's astonished by the fact that, that, that God blinded this magician. What is he astonished at? The teaching of the Lord. It's God's word that astonishes him most in the light of this incredible removal of, of opposition. <clears throat> it's God's word that he trusted in. And that is why we likewise rely on God's word. And so as we seek to go and make disciples, let this be an encouragement to you. When we proclaim the gospel message, when we wield the sword of the spirit that is God's word, there will be some people who will repent and turn to Christ. And those who seek to oppose it will not be able to stop it. God is actively working in this world and he's bringing all sorts of people to faith in Christ, and he's doing it through his witnesses. And so then we see an example of, of teaching in God's word at the next location that these men go to. And, and Paul teaches that it's God's preparation for Christ's coming in verses 13 through 25. So we're back at our map again. Verse 13 says, they leave this island of Cyprus. Again, I got a blue box there. It's kind of more in the center of the map now. If you follow that red arrow, that red line coming up from Cyprus, they, they go up to uh, the city of Perga. It's kind of a, a poor, poor city in a poor province of Pamphylia. And this is modern day Turkey, if that also helps. But they don't really seem to stay in this city for very long. But there is a, a brief but significant detail that happens while they're here. It says in verse 13 that that John Mark leaves now and he goes back to his mother's home in Jerusalem. This is where the disciples were gathered to pray when Peter escaped from prison in chapter 12. And notice it doesn't tell us why John left, right? And so all we can do again is, is just try to assume more than anything, I guess you could say. Perhaps he was just scared to kind of keep going on this journey. Perhaps he started to get homesick. Maybe he missed his mom or, or, or maybe he was actually sick, sick, and so he needed to go back and rest. Or, or, or maybe he, he didn't really agree as, as his kind of Jewish background that, 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 that we're reaching all these Gentiles with the disciples. We really, again, we don't know. And so any, any assumption or any, any reason that's given is, is purely hypothetical. But whatever the reason, we do learn that it doesn't sit well with Paul. On their next missionary trip in chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go, and, and Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark again. And Paul's like, nah, -uh. that guy abandoned us. I am not going on another journey with him. And as a result, Paul and Barnabas actually split ways. They go on separate journeys because Paul is so unwilling to go with John Mark, who is Barnabas's cousin. And Lord willing, when we get to that split in chapter 15, we'll be able to come back and look at this moment in greater detail and the ramifications it has between the relationship of these missionaries. <clears throat> but for now, we're gonna continue to follow Paul and uh, Barnabas on their journey. So they leave here after John goes back home and they head north to Pisidian Antioch. Again, follow that blue box. It's up a little bit higher now. Gotta really be able to focus in and see this one because you got a bunch of other words listed in here, but it's about 100 miles north of 
of where they were uh, down there in Perga. And so this is uh, Pisidian Antioch. It's different from the Antioch that they were at down in Syria, over kind of on the, the right side of that. Um, and once again, in this Roman colony that, that also has many uh, Jews and synagogues, Paul continues that pattern, right? He goes to the synagogue, it says this time, on the Sabbath. And the, the word synagogue uh, literally means basically assembly. <clears throat> and there's kind of uncertainty between, there's one of, one of two camps that, that synagogue started to kind of happen as kind of this natural, organic kind of gathering as, as Jews were kind of dispersing and, and they just wanted to continue to meet together and worship together. So, so they just kind of started to, to get together and then slowly developed into more of a formal structured thing. And others say, well, no, this was something that was, was kind of created uh, out of the Babylonian exile. Uh, they, they, were, they were captives, and, and they wanted to continue, so they, they formed these uh, structured gathering meeting places where they continued their, their structured worship that reflected the, the worship at the temple. But, but really, either way, the, the result's the same, right? We have Jews dispersing, and where they kind of collect together, they, they come together and establish synagogues to, to worship to be a, a hub of Jewish community, and to also help preserve their Jewish identity. And so there are kind of sparing pieces about what makes up a, a worship service. And so that kind of, this is a general list of, of what has been found by historians uh, to kind of make up a, an ancient uh, Sabbath worship service at a synagogue. And so first, they would gather during the same hours as the temple on a Sabbath day, and uh, in the, the, the synagogue, there'd be this big desk kind of central to everything. and Everyone would kind of be gathered around in a big circle around that desk. Um, and then you have the, the leaders of the synagogue had their special chairs, their chief seats. And uh, so they would sit there and then they would begin uh, with, with the creed from Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then together they would pray these 18 liturgical prayers known as the 18 blessings. So the whole congregation would be praying these prayers together. And then the leader would get up from his chair. He would go to the table. He would unroll the scroll. And first he would read a portion from the law. Then he would set that down. And, and then he would read a portion from the prophets. And he did this so that it would be done in the sight of all who were gathered to worship. And then after reading from these two portions it would be an open invitation to any Jewish male, adult Jewish male, to be able to share exposition and application. And then they would conclude with a benediction. And so this is kind of the, the, the general bones or idea of what the service that, that, that Saul, or excuse me, Paul and Barnabas are attending here in Acts chapter 13. And that's why in verse 15, they are invited to speak a word of exposition and application after the readings have taken place. Perhaps even... Paul specifically was invited because he was known among Jewish synagogues. But this is what transitions into uh, Paul's sermon here. This is one of four kind of major sermons in Acts. We've already seen the first two from Peter in chapters 2 and 3. And then the fourth will come from Paul in chapter 17. He preaches in chapter 17 on the validity of Christ to a skeptical crowd of Greeks. It's very different from the sermon that he preaches here, where he actually connects Jesus to the God of Israel to a crowd that is full of Jews in a synagogue worshiping God on the Sabbath. But in both sermons, Paul preaches the same gospel, but we see he is very flexible in his approach. And so we must do the same when we share the gospel. We cannot speak the same way to a, a grown adult whose parents maybe brought them uh, to church as they were growing up, but now they no longer believe, they're, they're doubtful, they don't think that, that it's true, as we would to someone who's maybe from a completely other country, and, and they really don't even know anything about the Bible, right? And so the gospel itself does not change. It's immovable. It is true. But we are flexible in the way that we share it. And this is the idea of contextualization making the gospel known in a way that is appropriate to a given context. And so this demands, on one hand, faithfulness to the gospel, that the gospel would remain and hold true, but also an understanding of a person's context, of where a person is to be able to contextualize that faithful truth to where they are at. And so here, Paul understands that he has a Jewish audience before him that believe 
in the Old Testament. So what does he do? He exalts Jesus from the pages of the Old Testament. He shows them that Jesus is their Savior. He is the Messiah that the Old Testament talks about. And their participation uh, in this area of synagogue would be safe to assume that they still hold out to some level of hope that the Messiah would come. And so Paul, he understands this context. He stands up in verse 16 to then faithfully preach the gospel to this context. And this sermon is an incredible demonstration of how gifted a teacher Paul truly is. He briefly recounts Israel's history very quickly right up to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of God's promises. And then he concludes with how the resurrection is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. And so beginning in verse 17, Paul takes just a few sentences to basically summarize hundreds of years of God's grace to his people. And so as we go through these next verses, I've underlined them on the slides, but I'd encourage you maybe make a note or underline the same. Notice how Paul is showing how God is the constant initiator with his people. First, he says, when it comes to the patriarchs, God chose them. Then he says, God is the one who made the people great in numbers while they were in Egypt. God took 70-some people, made them thousands within just a few generations. Next, he says, God led them out of Egypt. Verse 18, God put up with them in the wilderness. Verse 19, God destroyed the seven nations and then God gave them the promised land as their inheritance. And then he pauses for a moment in verse 20 and says, and all of this that God has done just up to this point so far took about 450 years. And then after that 450 years, God continues. He gave them judges, which is recorded in the book of Judges. Wasn't a pleasant time though because everyone was doing what they thought was right in their own eye. And then God gave them Samuel the prophet. Paul continues in verses 21 and 22. He says, God gave them Saul, but notice just before that, we see the first time the people initiate. They asked for a king. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then lastly, God removed Saul and God raised up David. So Paul's point with this summary is that the, the, the Israel's history is not random, It was God's preparation for Christ's coming. God always accomplishes his purposes all throughout human history. But then he also ends with this important contrast between Saul and David. Because again, as I mentioned moments ago, in this entire summary, God has been the initiator with his people, except in one case, the case of Saul. Why does he highlight this here? Because the people initiated the request for a king. And where did that come from? Because they were looking around the world. They were looking horizontally, not vertically. And they saw all these other nations who had a king. And they said, I want what they have. God is no longer good enough to be my king. I want a king like everyone else. And so then they turn to God and they say, give us a king. And God gave them what they asked for. He gave them King Saul, who really turned out to be a terrible king basically loses his mind, goes insane, mad with with vengeance and jealousy toward David. But then again, eventually, God removes Saul, and then God makes David king. See, in his summary, he's been emphasizing how God initiates with his people. He could have just jumped right to David, right? He doesn't even need to mention Saul unless he's mentioning Saul for a purpose. He is showing how the people's request for a human king was a rejection of God as their king. They wanted to be like the other godless nations around them. And this is what the Bible calls idolatry. In the, I don't know what word I want to describe it, but but the arrogant nature of these people is not only are they idolizing having a human king, but they go to God and ask God to help them with their idolatry. Give us something to worship and follow other than you, they say. And despite this just unbelievable gesture from these people, God had essentially prophesied and predicted this with, by demonstrating his sovereignty over human history. All the way back in Deuteronomy 17, 
God actually lists out these qualities of an ideal king for his people. He gives three, devotion to him, devotion to God, devotion to his law, and devotion to God's will. And so then after removing Saul, God raised up, Paul says here, a new king, King David. And look at what Paul's lesson is. It's not just that that, that he raised up David to be king, but what does he add here? He adds an evaluation of David as the king. He is a man after God's own heart who will do all God's will. This ties in with the same language of Deuteronomy 17. But we learn that even David was not a perfect king. And so it would take uh, another king that is promised through the line of David who would actually be the total fulfillment of that prophesied ideal king. And so this push forward to someone else, and Paul immediately jumps from that someone else of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel that ideal king, a savior. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah that God has been promising to our people, our entire existence. And so it's not like Paul is just kind of randomly just skipping a stone across the Old Testament and trying to kind of forcibly connect it all to Jesus. No, his, his sermon shows that there's a stream that goes through the Old Testament. It flows all the way to Jesus as, as the emphasis and the fulfillment of the entire Bible, all of the Old Testament, and continued into the New Testament. But Paul continues to teach before Jesus could even begin his public ministry. He had this forerunner, which again was prophesied a man named John the Baptist who who plays a vital role in this redemptive history, this history of God redeeming his people. And that's what John proclaimed, a baptism of repentance to all of God's people. Isaiah prophesied that, that, that this forerunner would prepare the way for the Messiah, for Jesus. And so Paul is teaching that, that John is the fulfillment of that and is in fact the last of the messianic prophets. And then he talks about how John, after completing his mission, was, was telling the people, do you think, who do you think I am? I'm, I'm not the Messiah. The, the one who is coming after me, that is the Messiah. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So John's prophetic role was, was huge. Because again, there'd been 400 years of silence that God's people were waiting and wondering. And suddenly this, this wild man shows up and begins proclaiming the the coming of the Lord, offering a baptism of repentance, and all this to prepare for the great work that God was about to do. He was a prophet, and the ultimate fulfillment was at hand. That's what, what Paul is teaching here. John is the conclusion of God's prophets that predicted the coming Messiah because it was immediately after him, this man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came. And so this is how Paul begins his sermon, with this brief sketch, this, this preparation of Christ's coming. He's, he's boldly teaching to these, these Israelites, these Jews, that, that, that Jesus is the climax of all of this. All of Old Testament history, it culminates in the arrival of David's greater offspring, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And then from there, he transitions to verses 26 through 41 with a proclamation of Christ's resurrection. See, he kind of gives the history, and then he kind of like leans in a little bit more and and begins to address them directly. Brothers, he says, sons of of the family of Abraham, those among you who who fear God, God fears, those who have converted to Judaism. He's saying the word of salvation, it's been brought to them. And remember the context here. He's speaking to these Jews in a place that is not Jerusalem. They have been dispersed from Jerusalem. And so he explains how the Jews in Jerusalem they had rejected Jesus. They didn't understand the prophets that they were reading every week on Sabbath. And so Paul is saying that salvation, it's coming to you, dispersed Jews, because those Jews in Jerusalem, they fulfilled the prophets by rejecting Jesus. He's saying you have hope because they condemned theirs. And it's an incredible example, again, of God's sovereignty. He continues to explain in verse 28. He's saying the Jews in Jerusalem, they had no grounds to put Jesus to death, and yet they asked Pilate to crucify him anyway. And these Jews likely assumed they were right because the Old Testament law says that cursed are all those who hang on a tree. And so Jesus' crucifixion to them was proof that he was cursed. And then after he died, they took him off this tree 
and they buried him in a tomb. But Paul is saying, no, God has, has sovereignly prophesied all these things. The Jews in Jerusalem, they unknowingly carried it all out by God's hand. Because after that, by raising Jesus from the dead, God confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah that the entire Old Testament was pointing towards. So his death on the cross was sufficient. His words were true. And then he goes on to show there are many eyewitnesses who confirm his resurrection. And so this is the hope, the message of hope, excuse me, that Paul is bringing to these listeners. The gospel is the fulfillment of God's promises to their ancestors. All that history has been filled even through the evil deeds of others. So again, Paul is a, a phenomenal teacher. I, I love the way he teaches. He's so gifted. After this, he goes on to, to quote several uh, Old Testament texts showing specific ways that Jesus fulfills prophecy. He does this throughout his New Testament letters. So you see in verse 33, he quotes Psalm 2-7 here. He is interpreting this in, in light of Christ's resurrection, showing how God actually prophesied when, when saying, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It was a, a prophecy of Jesus being raised from the dead. It connects him as God's son to his resurrection. In other words, what he is saying is by raising Christ from the dead, Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Paul teaches this elsewhere. Romans 1.4, he says, Jesus Christ, our Lord, was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. But is this saying that, that the resurrection is what made Jesus God's son? No, he has always been the eternal and divine son of God. The father declared that Jesus was his beloved son with whom he was well pleased before his death and resurrection. John 3, 16, he is God's only begotten son. So that's not what Paul is teaching. He is showing how this psalm is, is prophesying that the resurrection confirms what has always been true about Jesus. He was always the son. So when he rose, it completed his messianic work, proving that he is the son. And so now through this resurrection, we then can be adopted as God's children. We get to share in Christ's sonship. The author of Hebrews explains this. Chapter three, verse 14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We are companions, partakers with Christ. We share new life with him and through him. And Paul once again expands this in Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, the, the son of God, might be the firstborn among many brothers, brothers and sisters. So Christ is the firstborn among many children of God who are adopted through him in his resurrection to share a new life in him where we get to be his family. But then also as God's only begotten son, Jesus is the rightful king. He is the royal son of David. And so his resurrection shows, proves, if you will, that he could not be contained by death. That's what Paul continues to teach in verse 34. This resurrection is an eternal resurrection. He will never decay. He is not subject to death. In fact, he destroyed death. Then he gives two other Old Testament references here. Isaiah 55, 3, Psalm 16, 10, all three which assert to God's faithfulness in relation to his promise to David. It's an everlasting promise of eternal life fulfilled through Jesus. And he gives as an example, Jesus, he died, he was buried, but he did not decay. He rose from the grave. Unlike King David, who died, was buried, and decayed. So Paul's point is that Jesus is the hero of God's word. His crucifixion and his resurrection prove it to be true. And so then Paul concludes his sermon with application, verses 38 through 41. Therefore, we'll do the same. Paul basically answers this question in closing. What do Christ's death and resurrection then mean for us? He's not just laying this out as a bunch of historical facts. He's saying this is the good news of the gospel. This is the means of salvation, forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. By the resurrected Jesus, all who trust in him, he says, are free. This is the idea of justification, of being declared righteous in God's sight. And Paul emphasizes that this can't happen 
through the law of Moses. The law does not save us, it condemns us. It points us sinners to our only hope, Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law. So in terms of salvation, the chief role of the law is to point us to Christ because the law cannot change a person's heart, but it does confront the heart. It reveals the depth of human sin, but it will never transform the heart. So in one sense, it is true that God gave us a law that he knew we could not keep. But we see in the context of salvation, one of the chief reasons he gave it is because it reveals our hopelessness apart from him. And then that points us to Christ. Again, Paul teaches this all over the New Testament. Galatians 3.24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 2.16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So faith in Christ is what declares us righteous. Therefore, through Jesus, we are granted forgiveness of sins. Again, Paul in Ephesians 1, 7, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins. Why? According to the riches of his grace. And so what does all this mean that Paul is teaching? Most simply, he is teaching that salvation is forgiveness of sins and salvation is through Jesus Christ, trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And there are plenty other implications that we could explore on this subject, but Paul doesn't go into all that here. His focus is simply that, that we sin, we reject God, we reject Christ, we, we have idols before God, we always have, and we cannot perfectly obey God. This leaves us in a, in, in a state of desperate need. And there's only one remedy for this. The only way to be forgiven of our sins is through Jesus Christ, the one who frees us from the curse of our sins. He says, we can't make ourselves righteous by obeying the law. This is a gift we receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. And when we try, only two possible outcomes ha- will happen, either pride or despair. So trust in Christ. He is the solution. He took the consequences for our sin on the cross, sets us free from our condemnation, saying you are forgiven and you are free. And he says anyone and everyone can receive this gift through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we do, it's as if we have always perfectly obeyed because Jesus perfectly obeyed. God invites us all to rest our guilt and all our sin on Jesus so we can rest in the grace of Jesus. And when he says, go and make disciples, this is the message he tells us to go and share. And then he ends with an ominous warning in verses 40 and 41 that remind us of the need to be a witness to Christ, to share this message, to not be a scoffer because salvation, it is through Jesus Christ. And this is what makes disciples. So since this is true, if we want to go and make disciples, our message must be salvation through Jesus Christ as well. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us Christ, that you have taken our sins upon you, that you have just an incredible love for us that is unmatched, that knows no end. God, we 